I got saved in prison, um, serving a nine-year prison sentence. Uh, Jesus Christ came in my cell. I mean, he told me to follow him, and I was instantly born again. Everything radically changed for me. I didn't go home immediately after that, so it wasn't a jailhouse a religious experience. It was an authentic one, and I began to live for the Lord behind bars. I got called uh, to, the, to the pastorate in prison. Um, I got called to the ministry of deliverance in prison, but when I came out of prison, I joined the denomination, and they got that out of me, but that's a whole other story there. Um, and I went many years preaching against deliverance. My mind, my theological framework could not uh, embrace that. A, how can a spirit-filled Christian have a demon like living on the inside? And, and I had all of these, uh, these idioms and these proverbial statements that denominationalism says, you know, like how can the Holy Spirit live in the same house with the demon, you know? And well, then I began to, you know, living in New York, that, that, that made total sense to me because you could live in a house with roaches. How can I... And I, how many of you know you clean your house and then there's still something critter somewhere, you know? So, so my theology was um, wrestling with my, my cultural upbringing of, of where I was at. And we had one of the fastest growing churches uh, in the Bronx at that time, at least for my denomination. Now, this was 18 years ago. I was 24 years old. Uh, I was the youngest pastor in our denomination. Um, we were traveling as an evangelist. Um, my prison testimony became the catalyst of promoting this new Gen X. I'm not a millennial. I'm not a Gen Z. I'm a Generation X guy. All right, I'm almost 50. You know, so at that time, there was no internet. When I started preaching the gospel, when I got married, we didn't have cell phones. We didn't have internet. There was nothing. It was, you know, I used to reach out to her on a beeper or a pager. I'd pager. We had a code. I had, the code was my building number, you know. So, you know, um, things have changed uh, from then until now. So, um, so we had this fastest growing church in the Bronx um, was the mascot and the poster boy of the new generation with our denomination. But I was going home and I was punching walls. I was terrorizing my wife and I was a pastor and I was addicted to pornography. And I would come up and I'd preach and I'd prophesy and I'd uh, pray in tongues and the church couldn't tell the difference. Because I was in one of those denominations where... Um, behavior modification was more important than heart transformation. So everything was external adherence, you know, and, um, um, and I was frustrated and I ended up um, as a pastor going to see a psychologist just trying to um, uh, get some answers and I ended up helping my psychologist kind of get delivered. <laughs> She was like, young man, I like listening to you, you know, like, what? You know, she just sit there and smoke cigarettes and hear me out, you know. And, and get set free, I didn't know, you know. Um, it wasn't until I got to a place of, I went beyond desperation to a place of groaning, you know. Um, hunger will bring a vis uh, you know, hunger will bring a visitation, but groaning will produce a habitation. You know, the children of Israel hungered to get delivered for 400 years, but God never showed up. It was just hunger. It wasn't until they started groaning this is why fasting is so important because it causes your flesh to groan. This is why the young man went from, you know, desiring freedom to actually God beginning the process of full breakthrough because your flesh now is, it's not just hungry. You're, you're, in three days, how I many you know three days, you, you know, your flesh is groaning at that time, you know. You know, a smell of, a smell will make you want to break the fast and, and go eat. You know, um, I got to a place of groaning because um, I was bound. I was so bound um, as a pastor of a successful church that one day coming out of the church, me and my wife got into an argument simply because I just told the church to pray for me. And, and this is how enslaved we were to make sure nobody knows what we're dealing with. How many of you know that, you know, uh, in my culture, you know, Latino culture, you know, we take secrets to the grave. You know, we just never tell you. You know, so I was kind of living and embodying that. And in the middle of the argument, I like, I jumped out the car. Like while the car was moving, I jumped out the car ready to just, wanted to hit her, you know, right there in front of the street and everybody, you know, like, and that, that was the moment when I realized that, that something was inherently wrong 
you know, as a pastor, um, it never hit her, thank God, never went to that level. Um, but how many of you know emotional abuse is just as worse as physical abuse? You know, if I could hurt her with my words and my children with my words, you know, I think sometimes that's probably even more damaging because you could heal from a physical wound, but sometimes it takes, you can't heal from a, a word wound, you know. And in that moment, um, I asked the Lord, I said, okay, Lord, what, what the the heck is going on you know and uh, um, he began to tell me to revisit this idea of deliverance and right there I said no a Christian can't have a demon and, and I'm telling God demonize a Christian can't have a demon God you know so I'm demonized saying I'm not de that there's no such thing as being demonized you know um, one day you know one day in the middle of a staff meeting how many of you know staff meetings could get intense sometimes? If you're not a pastor, then, you don't, then you, when you become a pastor, you'll know that when it's time to touch the funds and rearrange, rearrange some stuff, you know, it could get a little intense in the meeting, you know? So in the middle of a pastoral staff meeting with my staff, many of them are still with me to this day. Um, for some reason, I had gotten a, a no on something. Like, you know what, Pastor? No, no, I don't think we should do that right now. And I lost it. I got enraged in the middle of a, of a meeting. I like literally lost it in the middle of this meeting to the point that I manifested. I was manifesting in a meeting. And the next thing I know, in front of my pastors, I'm on the floor slithering like a snake in front of my pastors. Now, two things are happening to me. I'm talking to myself saying, Alex, you are embarrassing yourself. Like, they're definitely going to leave the church after this, you know? And then there's this other pervading thought that I wanted to take the church chairs and bash everyone's head in at the same time. But I couldn't move because while I was slithering on the floor like a snake, I wasn't moving and slithering. I was in place while slithering because there was a foot this big on my back. And when I turned like this, there was nothing, there was nobody there. And I heard a voice on my right ear said, I've been sent from heaven to make it manifest. Allow it to manifest because today it's leaving. It's a true story. And I yelled out this loud shriek. I shrieked so loud that the capillaries in my face broke open. And my whole face was bloodshot red with, with, with freckles from broken vessels. And, and I let out this loud shriek. And then it just left. And I heard the voice say again to me, it's gone. Don't look for it. And when I got up, I felt this part of my chest was completely peaceful. And I realized that that's where the demon had been lodging. I had a generational curse of destruction. That was the demon that was operating in my life, which means nothing in my life ever lasted. I always messed up whatever good was given to me relationships squandered uh, money squandered ministry opportunities closed holidays ruined I ruined all of our holidays up until that point Christmas I woke up in a bad mood how many of you woke up in a bad mood on Christmas morning I don't want to talk to nobody you know I'm, we all having Christmas dinner I'm in the room somewhere I'm not coming out you know holding my family hostage birthdays you can forget about it I was a terror. Every year, I was always ruining, and I had a generational curse of destruction and generational curse of ruin. And at that moment, it left. It left. How many of you know that when you get delivered, your theology changes? And I don't know who I'm talking to today, man. My theology changed, and the power of God hit me so hard in that staff meeting that it spilled over now here's what's interesting that while I was manifesting on the floor I vaguely heard one of my leaders say in the background finally our pastor's getting delivered <laughs> I vaguely heard to this day I don't know who said that but finally it was a Somebody said, finally, we, and I heard somebody say, we've been waiting for this day. You know? And the power of God hit me at that moment, and it spilled over to everyone in that room. 
one by one, whoever got close to me at that moment trying to give me a hug like, whoa, pastor, what was that? The power got hit them. And by, by the time I turned around, all of my staff was on the floor manifesting, getting delivered. In the basement of the church, we had uh, two of the young people. They were a bit older at that time. Two young adults. They were practicing for the Easter play. So it was, we were in like Holy Week, Passion Week at that time. They were down since past. So they heard the commotion. I mean, they run upstairs. And as soon as they came, maybe about maybe 10 feet from me, they got thrown back by the power of God. The other one that was with them tried to run around and come around. <laughs> tried to run around and come this way to leave. Right? And I was laying there on the floor. And when he walked by, I tapped him on his ankle and he got thrown by the power of God. <laughs> and the young man ends up taking out bags of dope out of his pocket. And he threw it on the floor and said, Pastor, I had been planning to backslide after Easter. And he got fully delivered. And everyone at that meeting is still uh, serving the Lord uh, today. Most of them are still with me and others have transitioned on to uh, other other congregations and that's what I want to talk to you today about and hopefully we can get to that place the title of my message is you're not digging deep enough I know that we are in a deliverance house and praise God that I don't have to convince you guys of deliverance because as I travel the country I spend an enormous amount of time just trying to get to the church get the church to a place of agreeing that a Christian could potentially be demonized I am so grateful that I don't have to do that here. That I don't have to convince anything other than those of you that are here uh, new for uh, the first time. I want you to turn with me very quickly to the book of Ezekiel, uh, chapter, chapter 8. I want to talk to you about you're digging, but you're not digging deep enough. Some of you, your deliverance can only be acquired when there is a perpetual, intended, militant, aggressive effort in continuing to dig until you find the nucleus of what actually is going wrong in your life. Now, most of us, we get deliverance once or twice, and we kind of stop there. Or we kind of just linger in this ecosystem of deliverance where... You know, I'm, I'm in a house of deliverance, and I'm good, you know, and you come up to the altar, um, and amen. Deliverance, you know, it's actually a labyrinth. It's not a maze. A maze can just be figured out by just retracing your steps, and you, you follow this particular pattern of, you know, go forward 10 steps, turn right, and when you turn right, you know, go left, and then go back one, and then go this way, and if you keep repeating it, then you kind of figure your way out. And that's where most kind of churches, they, we get into this ritualistic, you know, this patterned version of deliverance where we dwell in this ecosystem of deliverance and we just kind of, yeah, I know that. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, and it's, it's kind of, but then there's this underlying issues that go deep that can only be figured out not through, not through repetition, but through the supernatural gift of the word of wisdom where you can figure out how do you really get delivered? Because true deep deliverance is figuring out a labyrinth. And in case you don't know what a labyrinth is, in order to get out of a labyrinth, it has nothing to do with, uh, it has nothing to do with uh, following uh, the same protocol. It has to do with problem solving. Because sometimes a door in a labyrinth actually that says exit is a lie and actually takes you back to the beginning. That's what a labyrinth is. It's like Alice in Wonderland, where you drink, you think this, what you're drinking, uh, God, it looks like poison, but God is saying, drink that, so that way Alice can shrink enough size and humble yourself to get into a little door that's actually narrow. For the kingdom is actually a narrow door. Did you catch that revelation? So this is how deliverance, that's where I was. I was trapped in trying to figure it out, uh, trying to... Uh, um, protocol my way through deliverance other than finding that it's actually requiring me to go deeper Ezekiel chapter 8 now what I'm going to do today is I'm not going to give you a sermon you know the three points um, I'm going to give you a thought I'm going to do what is called an exhaustive teaching which means I'm going to take one thought and I'm going to drive that point in repeating it leading up to we'll call you up and 
and we help you get delivered. How many of you want to get delivered this morning or go through some deeper deliverance? Amen. All right, so um, I'm going to kind of take you there apostolically. I'm going to take this one thought and I'm going to keep driving in. So it's not going to be where is this heading and what is the conclusion? It's going to be a battering ram of the same thing. Bang, 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 bang. Why? Because each time we bang in, we're digging deeper. We're digging deeper. Because the title is you're not digging you're not digging deep enough. As a matter of fact, hold your finger there. Actually, the opening context is in Deuteronomy 23 verses 9 through 14. And then it's Ezekiel chapter 8. Now remember, you're not digging deep enough. Catch the metaphor there. Deuteronomy 23 verse 9 through 14. Now look at what this says and keep the metaphor in your mind or the type and the shadow or the symbolism to help you understand a spiritual truth. When you are encamped against your enemies, keep away from everything impure. Verse 10 now. If one of your men is unclean because of a nocturnal emission, he is to go outside the camp and stay there. But as evening approaches, he is to wash himself. And at sunset, he may return to the camp. Now look at verse 12. Here's where things get very interesting. You must designate a place outside the camp where you can go relieve yourself. Now look at this. As part of your equipment, you must have something to dig with. Now the King James Version will tell you a small shovel. All right? Now look what it says. Where you can go relieve yourself. Now, I believe we all know what relieve yourself here is actually meaning. Okay? Look at verse 13. As part of your equipment, you must have a small shovel to dig with. Now stop right there. Let me just interject something. For too long, we've only been carrying swords. And God is saying, with your sword, carry a shovel. Did you catch that revelation? For too long, we're either, because we're evangelical, we're either carrying a sword or we're told to build. So we're either carrying a sword on one hand like Nehemiah and a hammer on the other. There's actually a third equipment that you and I also, also have and it's actually a shovel. Why? Because in the process of our fighting against your enemies and also in the process of our building, there are moments that you need deliverance. That you need to relieve yourself. And in the middle of your war, you can't just say, hold on enemy and then stop and then take care of business. You can't do that. Because if not, guess what happens when you do that? And here's what happens with many of us in the deliverance ministry or in this deliverance ecosystem. We're fighting enemies. Uh, we're also building while we're fighting. But at the same time, we're defecating all over the camp. Now watch this. Look at this. As part of your equipment, have something to dig with. When you relieve yourself, dig a hole and cover up your excrement. For the Lord your God moves about in your camp to protect you and deliver you from your enemies so your camp must be holy so that he will not see your excrement while he's defending you. So do you see it? So for too long, God is in our midst. How many of you know God is in our midst? But at the, How many of you know he's protecting us in our midst? How many of you know that he is also fighting against the enemies? But as he is walking, watch this, against the enemies, he is also noticing at the same time that there is feces all over the camp. So this is the reason why it's saying that as we go to war, not only are we slaying enemies, not only must we be holy, but at the same time as we're fighting, we should be digging holes. And as we dig a hole, what do we do? In the moment when we're fighting and we feel that we need deliverance, we are to relieve ourselves in the hole and cover it up and keep fighting. This is the reason why the title of my message is, you're not digging deep enough. You have to dig deeper to be able to put all the excrement inside the hole and cover it up 
and continue in your warfare. Now, the reason why I'm bringing this up is because this house has a deliverance ecosystem. So I'm not teaching something that you haven't already been doing. What God sent me here to do is to tell some of you that you're actually fighting. You're actually warring on good warfare. But at the same time, where are you putting and where are you relieving yourself? Now, look at this. Ezekiel chapter 8 now. Turn with me. Is this good or is this... going over it just kidding all right then he brought me to the door of the temple I feel the Holy Spirit right now then he brought me to the door of the temple courtyard where he could see a what in the wall he can see a hole in the wall now look what it says he said to me now son of man dig into the wall so I dug into the wall and found a what I found a hidden doorway. Bingo. There is where my spirit of generational curse and strong man of destruction, that's where it was hiding. Now what's interesting in this text was that this doorway was hiding behind a wall that was covered. And the only way that they was able to be able to go beyond the wall is Ezekiel had to dig into a small hole that God by the finger of the Lord had poked into the wall. This is why the Bible says if I cast out demons by the finger of God then surely the kingdom is among you. Now many of your problems that those of you under the sound of my voice you're saying but I don't understand I'm, I'm, I'm in deliverance. What, what, what is still potentially wrong with me? Very simple. You haven't paid attention to the small hole that the finger of Lord has poked in a wall that you think is nothing there. The door is behind a wall that has been plastered over, but God loves you enough to tell you there's a hole there, pay attention to it. And the only way you could go there is Holy Spirit, remove the wall. No, the Holy Spirit is not going to remove the wall. You have to take the shovel and you have to dig and watch this and you have to dig deep enough to be able to find it. So it's not just why well, I did look there's nothing there. God says dig deeper. Dig deeper. It's nothing different than what Elijah told the servant when he said I don't see anything and he said go back and look again and go back and look again and go back and look again and finally finally the servant came back and said, I see a cloud the size of a man's a prophet, apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher, the size of a man's hand. I see something there. And then the Bible says, Elijah said, prepare for I hear what? The sound of an abundance of rain. So I dug into the wall and I saw a hidden doorway. And God said, go in and see the wicked and detestable sins they are committing there. So I went in and saw the walls covered with engravings of all kinds of crawling animals and detestable creatures. And I also saw various idols worshipped by the people of Israel. So in this text, as he dug deeper he was able to find a hidden doorway like a labyrinth because had he been amazed he would have walked by and said there's nothing there I'm going to keep going but God said the way to get out or the way to go through deeper deliverance is problem solving which means what looks like nothing is there could actually be the place where something actually is there so how do you and I receive deeper deliverance by digging deep enough now look at this Turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17. I'm going to show you the four levels of what this actually means, and then we'll kind of call you up, and we'll help you get set free. How many of you want to get set free? Amen. Amen. Now look what it says. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17 says, Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, says the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. Notice how the verse here does not say, touch not the sinful thing. Most of us are not touching the sinful thing. Notice how it doesn't say, touch not the abominable thing. Most of us are not touching the abominable thing. The text here says, touch not the unclean thing. Unclean and sinful are not the same thing. 
Unclean just means ceremonially unfit to serve. That's all it means. It means on a sit down until you're ready to serve again. This is why when the priest would touch something unclean, they weren't disqualified from the priesthood. They were unfit to serve for a particular time frame. And then they were qualified again. Maybe the reason why, even after your deliverance, that you're wondering, why is it that I still feel like I'm on sit down and I'm going through deliverance? It's not because you're doing something sinful. It's because there are unclean things that are there hidden in a doorway that God is actually saying you you're not digging deep enough because you don't know that it is wrong. See, now watch this. There are four levels of what this this unclean thing would actually mean and I'm just going to give it to you very quickly number one is the word defile number two is the word contaminated number three is unclean and number four means corrupted now watch this the word defile means no longer in a state of purity or perfection because someone touch it now to help you understand this when a woman is raped in the bible it doesn't say rape it actually says she was defiled. Defiled means that the innocence of her virginity was taken that she could never get it back. Now spiritually, I know how we can kind of wordplay that and get people delivered and God will give them the innocence of that experience back spiritually. But in the natural, once something is virgin and now it's no longer a virgin, you can never make it a virgin again. And this is why the Bible says that when someone loses or someone loses their virginity, they are considered defiled which means the state of innocence and purity is no longer there because someone uh, touched it. Now, what does this have to do with us? Because just because someone touched it uh, doesn't mean you're carrying it. It means someone just touched it. So if a woman was raped, she is not carrying rape. She was raped, but she's not walking away with rape. It just means that her innocence has been removed. That's called to be defiled. To be defiled. Now watch this. The second word is contaminated. It means the same thing as the first one. It means no longer in a state of perfection or pure. It means someone touched it, but this time, now you're carrying it. So watch this. So now the person was touched and they were molested and raped. But now they walk away and now they're having desires to rape. So now they are contaminated. Now, I'm using that as an example because of the, the level of infraction of how bad rape is. But this could be anything, which means this is why the Bible says bad company corrupts good morals, which means you could get around somebody who's negative and now you're defiled. But it doesn't necessarily mean you've been contaminated. But once you start getting in a relationship with them and you start listening to what they are saying, even though you leave their presence, now you are contaminated. So now I can tell who you're talking to because you're talking just like them. You are contaminated just like them. So this could be for anything. You're listening to secular music, watching too much TV, whatever the case may be. Now when you get around it, you're defiled. But when you walk away from it, now you're contaminated. It's not the same thing. Okay, now unclean. The word unclean is connected to the first two, right? So the Bible says, touch not the unclean thing so watch this it means no longer in a state of perfection or purity someone touched it not only are you carrying it but now God has to sit you down because now not only are you carrying it now you want to touch other people so God says I have to sit you down because not only are you carrying molestation on you now as a preacher you're desiring to now molest other people because you were molested so this is the reason why when you're unclean, God has to sit you down because now you've been given a place of influence and your contamination can now be transferred on other people. So God says, touch not the unclean thing because then I'm going to have to sit you down with your anointed self simply because what you're carrying on the inside can be now transferred to other people. And watch this. You don't know what you're carrying because you haven't dug deep enough. So sometimes you don't know that you're carrying. A bad attitude can be a demon and you think it's just a bad attitude. It can be anything. So God is saying, touch not the unclean thing and I will receive you. See? See, look at this. And then the fourth one is corrupted. Corrupted is the 
final resting place of the first three which means you go beyond defiled of just being touched you go beyond contaminated of just having it you go beyond unclean now you want to give it now you are it which means now the person have embraced what they are so we'll say things like this uh, that's not a demon that's just my attitude of how I am do you see it now watch this so how do you get to the level of addressing this God has a fail-safe plan for that. Look at this. Turn with me to 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 35. Is this good? Yes. Amen. All right, so I'm an apostle, so I do a lot of revelating before I actually do deliverance because deliverance without revelation is, is, is witchcraft, okay? So, all right, you have to teach the people so they can understand. All right, look at this. How do we get to that place? Look at this. Second King, now here is where I'm going to drive a point in. That's just my introduction. <laughs> it's not the message. <laughs> okay. I want to be free. I don't want to be a person of influence having my own issues still. Because my issues can be transferred on other people. And they will receive what I fail to get delivered from. And sometimes I don't know that I need to be delivered because I already live in this ecosystem of deliverance. Do you see what I'm saying? So look at this. Look at this. 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 35. Just one verse. Then he returned and walked in the house to and fro and went up and stretched himself upon him. And the child sneezed how many times? Seven times. And the child opened his eyes. So what do we see here? We see the prophet outstretching himself over this young child. And what happened? And he rebuked the network of death there, and death came out of this young man's body by the sneezing of how many times? Okay, now sneezing, I think I'm preaching to the choir with this one, but sneezing is your body's way of conducting deliverance in the natural. When your body has a foreign bacteria, you don't even ask for it, boom, your body releases it. Your body casts it out. Did you catch it? All right, so in this situation, the spirit of death was working inside the young boy, and the spirit of death came out from where? From the inside. Hold this thought. 2 Kings chapter 5, verse 14. Same book, chapter or later. Okay, then Naaman went down and he dipped himself. How many times? He dipped himself seven times according to the saying of the man of God. And what, what does the Bible say? I love what the Bible says in the King James Version. Look what it says in the natural. It says what was restored to him. It says his innocence. This goes back to what we were saying. Did you catch it? So how many times did he dip himself to get to that place? Seven times. And this, this cleansing was not on the inside. Where was this cleansing at? It was on the outside. So the young child got cleansed on the inside seven times to be able to break it, go deeper. And now, watch this. The, Naaman dipped himself seven times on the outside to dig deeper on the outside. Watch this. Look at this. Leviticus chapter 8. Leviticus chapter 8, verse 10 and 11. Look what it says. It says, And Moses took the anointing oil and anointed the tabernacle and all that was therein and sanctified them. And he sprinkled on the altar, what? Seven times and anointed the altar and all the vessels and the laver, his foot to do what with them? To sanctify them. Here's my question. Why isn't one time good enough? Why, do we, why did Moses have to anoint the holy things more than once? When For us, you know, in the Christian church, we do it one time. Do you see what I'm saying? So not only this, your anointing and the glory that you carry and your assignment also needs to get purged because the last thing you want to be is prophet, but you're a nasty prophet. The last thing you want to be is an apostle, but you're a Jezebel apostle. Did you catch what I just said? The last thing God wants to do is to allow you to get to a place of influence and give you a bazooka, but you're still a child and you're blowing people up. Okay, so watch this. So look at this. So it's not just you need to get anointed. Your gifting and your callings also need to get delivered as well. Now look at this. Watch this. Leviticus chapter 14. Leviticus chapter 14. Verse 51. He will take a cedar stick and a hyssop branch, the scarlet yarn, and a live bird, and dip them 
in the blood of the slaughtered bird and into the fresh water. And then he will sprinkle the what? He will sprinkle the house seven times. So not only does the furniture in the house go through a measure of deliverance seven times. Not only did a young boy get delivered from the inside seven times. Not only did the man of influence get delivered on the outside seven times. But now God is saying not only just anoint what's inside the house, anoint the house seven times. So now you got to go deeper seven times. So we have seven, 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 seven. Right? Now watch this. Now watch this. Look at this. Look at this. Proverbs chapter 24 verse 16. Look what it says. For a righteous man falls. Not one time. Falls how many times? Seven times and does what? And rises up again. Watch this. Watch this. Watch this. The Bible is very clear that Mary Magdalene was delivered of how many? The Bible says, out of whom came out seven demons. Now watch this. Last, look at this. Look at this. Last, second to last verse. Exodus 29, verse 4 through 9. Closing context. We'll call you up. Hallelujah. Present Aaron and his sons at the entrance of the tabernacle. And wash them with water. Dress Aaron in his priestly garments. The robe worn with ephod. The ephod itself and the breastplate. Then wrap the decorative shash of ephod around him. Look at verse 6. Place the turban on his head. And fasten the medallion to the turban. Look at verse 7. Then anoint him by pouring the anointing oil over his head. Next, present his sons and dress them in their tunics. So watch this. Let me just interject. Notice that there's a generational transfer going on here. So the head is being completely wardrobe changed. And what does the text say? That as the head gets it, give it to the sons. Watch this. Look at this. Look at this. Wrap the sashes around the waist of Aaron and his sons and put their special head coverings on them. Look what it says. Then the right... The legal right to the priesthood will be theirs by law forever. In this way, you will ordain Aaron and his sons. Now watch this. Jump down to verse 35 and 37. Look at this. Look at this. This is how you will ordain Aaron and his sons to their offices. Just as I commanded you. Look what the text here says and I'm done. We'll call you up. Help you get free. The ordination ceremony will go on how many? Here's my question. Isn't one ordination service good enough? Why must I do it seven days? Imagine, have you ever been to a consecration service? That could be long and dragged out, right? And they're beautiful. Imagine doing that seven days. The Christian church, we only do it once, right? Now, why would God say, I thought when something was anointed, it's already clean. Let me say it again. I thought w once something is already anointed with the oil and cleaned and ready and dressed, I thought that that's it. Why would God say, do this for seven days? Why? Because hidden inside Aaron was a golden calf that he would allow the people to worship. Oh, you missed that. Sometimes you don't know what's really in there so God is saying you have to keep repeating it until you go deeper and go deeper and go deeper and go deeper until you actually find it until you've dug deep enough and when you dig deep enough bingo there it is most of us stop on the first day that was a good ceremony I'm good I got delivered some of us might even go to the second or third day because we're being submissive to our pastors and leaders. 
But God is saying your issue is way too deep for you to think that one altar call and one deliverance session and one help me go through some renouncing is going to be good enough. How many of you know that your issues run 30, 15 years deep that just waving over me like Benny Hinn is not good enough? That's a good place for the first day. But baby, you got six more days to get in here. Aaron had to go through seven consecrations to get deep enough to allow him to authentically be ready to serve in the capacity that God was going to take him. This is why many of you get delivered and you're kind of just still serving in your church. And amen. Stay there. But for some of you, some of you will graduate from serving to leadership. And then there are others that are here that will graduate from helping another man's vision come to pass that eventually God will place in your hands your own vision. There are apostles and prophets, evangelists, pastors and teachers in this very crowd. The Christian experience is not just serve in my church. That's the first place. The point is to get to the point of consecration, of release, to operate and function in the, in the temple. God is saying you have to go through all seven days hello Mary Magdalene you have to go through all seven demons I have to get out this is the reason why the Bible says when an unclean spirit leaves it comes back with what seven this is why you have to keep going we have to and God sent me here to tell you that you for many of you God is saying you need another form of equipment God says put your sword down put the hammer on the on the hammer belt and God says go get yourself a shovel God says you're anointed. God says you're anointed, but still nasty. God says you have favor, but you're a ticking time bomb. God says right now you're submissive because you have never been told no. Right now all is well. It's very easy to say I'm good. I got anointed on the first day. God says you don't know the future. You don't know the future. Especially for those of you that would say, I would never do that. Hello, Peter, I would never deny you. Really? Today you're going to deny me. Did you catch it? And God is saying that he, he honors the fact that you started the process because some don't even get to the first day. But God says your anointing, consecration, and full deliverance has just started. Baby, you got six more days. God says some of you have five more days. Some of you have three more days. Some of you, for some of you, God is saying, you got one more day left. Don't mess it up. Ah! Ah! Some of you, right at the cusp, on the sixth day of your ordination, we mess up. Because the church is taking too long to launch me. Oh, I don't know where my destiny is or whatever the case may be. And on that last day, you mess it up. And you walk away. Now you have to start that thing all over again. And what happens? God does not banish you. That's not grace. We're under grace. Thank God for grace. But God puts you on sit down. Because you're unclean. You're unfit for service right now. I can't allow that with that still in there. Because, and, and it's still there because you haven't dug deep enough.